Welcome to the British Home Front in the First World War. This series was recorded at the University of St Andrews in June 2018 to accompany a conference marking the contribution by the peoples of the British Isles to the national war effort. In this set of podcasts, we look at trade unions and the rise of the Labour Party, conscription, charitable work and refugees, internees and prisoners of war. We hear now from Professor Panikos Panayi about those who were interned and prisoners of war. My name's Panikos Panayi and I'm a professor of European history at De Montfort University in Leicester. One of my main areas of interest is the experience of Germans in Britain during the First World War, both outside internment and within internment camps. Also the experience of military prisoners of war within Britain during the Great War. There were three types of internees in Britain. The first type were people who found themselves within Great Britain when the First World War broke out. Some of these just happened to be on British soil. One of the most famous examples is a man called Paul Cohen, Paul Time, who wrote a wonderful memoir of his experience called Time Stood Still. He was an artist who was painting on the South Coast when the war broke out, and he eventually found himself in internment. There's also a very long-standing German community of all different social classes, and there are over 50,000 of those. So that's the first category. The second category are people who were brought to Britain from all over the world, because this is still the height of the British Empire and the Royal Navy. So if you happen to be crossing the Atlantic on a ship in 1914, in August, September 1914, or even after that, and you were a German, then you may find yourself spending five years in an internment camp in Britain. If you were a trawlerman in the North Sea, you could end up in an internment camp. Also, because of the global power of the British Empire and the Royal Navy, people were arrested in other parts of the world and brought to internment camps in Britain. The third category is military prisoners. These are overwhelmingly caught on the Western Front. At the end of 1916, the government decides to bring them from France and Belgium to help with the harvest, but also in other areas. There's also a few naval prisoners and even some Zeppelin crews, but very few of those. Internment, especially of civilians, but also to some extent of military prisoners, began shortly after the outbreak of the war at the beginning of August 1914. The government couldn't make its mind up whether it wanted wholesale internment. It was basically a male experience. Women weren't interned except a small handful who were regarded as a military threat. So initially, the camps are haphazard and temporary. Things like race courses are used, Newbury race course. Some of the worst camps for civilians were ships that were off the south coast, Hyde, Gospel and South End, and they were the ones that were most universally condemned. As the war progressed for civilians, the key camp is on the Isle of Man, Nokelo. That becomes very formalised and there's almost a civilization that develops there. At one point, there's 23,000 people, which makes it a de facto the capital of the Isle of Man because it counts more people than Douglas. Once some military prisoners begin arriving at the end of 1916, it again becomes slightly more haphazard. There are some long-standing military camps, for instance, Pattis Hall in Northamptonshire, which is initially a civilian and then becomes a military camp. Kegworth is another example. There's up to 600 camps by the end of the war. Some of these are even farms. There's even migratory gangs moving from one harvest to another. Conditions for the internees were basically good. From the point of view of internment, the injustice comes from the whole policy of civilian internment. Once internment takes place, the British basically play by the rules of the Hague Conventions. You can find lots of individual examples of mistreatment, but it's a fair system. Having said that, there is constant complaints by the German internees, both within Britain and those who are held in other parts of the British Empire. Food is one thing that's constantly complained about, and it's the monotony of the food. Their rations are fair, the British Army rations. In 1918, the War Office has come to the conclusion that horse flesh is eaten in Germany, and therefore the internees should be able to eat this, but this causes deep resentment. 
Paul Cohen, Paul Time, a middle class internee who wrote the memoir Time Stood Still, resented the lack of space and also the lack of freedom. He summarized the experience of internment in this way. There is nothing like it to be found anywhere else. Monks retire to their cells. Soldiers have their days or weeks off. Here it continues forever. And the longer it continues, the more you suffer from it. No privacy, no possibility of being alone, no possibility of finding quietude. It is inhuman, cruel and dreadful to force people to live in closest community for years. It becomes almost unbearable when that community is abnormally composed like that of a prisoner's camp. There are no women, no children, there is no old age and next to no youth there. There is just the casual rabble of men forced to be inseparable. Try to imagine, though it is impossible really to understand without having experienced it, what it means never to be alone and never to know quiet and not for a minute and to continue for years and you will begin to wonder that there was no general outbreak of insanity, that there yet remained a difference between lunacy and barbed wire nerves. This is Paul Stoffer, an Austro-Hungarian who was interned in various camps in Britain during the war, including Alexandra Palace. He provided quite a depressing, moving account of a man who was visited by his wife in Alexandra Palace, because the internees in Alexandra Palace tended to come from London near the families. This is his description. It was pathetic to watch the painful excitement of the men whose visitors were due in the afternoon. Suddenly oblivious of the existence of their comrades, they were a prey to subdued suspense all the morning. And as soon as the midday was over, they started their preparation, each man deliberately anxious to look his best. Long before three o'clock, which was the appointed hour for visitors, they assembled with their little bunches of flowers and toys for the children and were then marched off to the visiting rooms. I was once allowed to assist and shall never forget the scene. The men sitting at one side of a long table and the visitors filing in to sit down opposite. Here a father with a child on his lap, timidly peering into the face of the strange man. There an elderly couple, hardly speaking, just looking and looking at one another with an intensity of longing that words cannot express. Elegant young women with engagement rings on their fingers. Poor working women with a bevy of half-starved children. A grim-looking solicitor with a pile of papers in front of him. Visitors from another world bringing solace to some and tearing open the wounds of others. It made me feel almost glad that I could not have visitors. It seemed cruel to allow the poor wretches to have their world so near to them, only to be snatched away after a few moments. One of the main reasons why internment of German civilians was introduced in Britain was the level of hostility which those who remained at liberty faced. This peaked in May 1915 following the sinking of the passenger liner Lusitania by a German submarine when over a thousand civilians were killed as a result of this. I can quite confidently say that virtually every German-owned shop in Britain was destroyed, and I'd been through the newspapers. In the case of Leicester, there was even an attack on a shop owned by somebody who'd been on holiday to Germany before the First World War. Some of the most violent attacks took place in Liverpool, which was the home port of the Lusitania, but also in London, where about 50% of German civilians lived before the outbreak of the First World War. The Times summarised this in an article of 13th of May 1915, and it focuses especially on the East End of London. There was very little work done in the East End throughout the day. Shopkeepers of unequivocal British birth in the areas where rioting was most violent thought it wise to close their doors for the day. And in some of the streets which run off Commercial Road, there was scarcely a shop which was not shuttered. The damage done by the rioters was very great. Not content with smashing doors and windows and looting for the whole of the furniture and the contents of the shops, the interiors of the houses were in numerous instances greatly damaged. Staircases were hacked to pieces and ceilings were knocked down. Shops were completely wrecked before the police had time to arrive on the scene. At Poplar, for instance, 
in an area of a quarter of a mile, half a dozen houses were attacked simultaneously by different crowds in the early afternoon. Before the constables were able to attempt to disperse the mob, horse-drawn carts, hand carts and perambulators besides the unaided arms of men, women and children had taken everything away from the wrecked houses. One saw pianos, chests of drawers, dresses and the heaviest types of household furniture being carted triumphantly through the stream. Here is wealth for the taking, said one man, who had possessions of several spring mattresses and was calmly driving his overloaded donkey cart down Crisp Street. After internment takes place, the hostility of the British population towards Germans declines, but that's partly because there isn't anything else left to write against. The May 1915 rights had been so thorough. What does happen is that there's a discourse in some of the newspapers which talks of, to use the contemporary word, molly coddling the Germans. Much of the focus is Donington Hall in Leicestershire, because that's an officer's camp. One of the things that's deeply resented is the fact that officers have access to alcohol, which they have to pay for. But then some independent investigations are carried out by the US and Swiss embassies, which have responsibility for German interests in Britain during the war. And they come to a conclusion that actually conditions aren't particularly favourable. There's two interpretations which emerged during the First World War about life behind barbed wire. The first one was by Adolf Lucas Fischer. He was one of the Swiss embassy inspectors. He made many visits to the Isle of Man, uh, Nokelo, and the second camp on the Isle of Man, Douglas. He published a book called Barbed Wire Disease. He saw barbed wire disease as an inevitable consequence of spending time behind barbed wire or in internment. He said that anyone who'd spent time within a camp suffered from it. I guess we need to understand it as a type of psychosis. When Fisher describes the symptoms, he talks about people who mope around, who stay silent for a long time, who find it difficult to interact with people. So it's maybe mild depression. Having said that, there's very few suicides amongst the internees. Both I and other people have done comparisons with suicides of the general population, and actually the suicide rate is quite low. Barbed wire disease exists, but you would have to describe it as a mild form of depression. There's an alternative view of internment in World War I Britain, which says that actually people didn't sit around getting depressed. The internees formed prison camp societies. They revolve around all sorts of issues. Sport becomes very popular. Allotments take off. Newspapers are published by the internees. Theatre may be the most important activity of all because it creates the biggest sense of community. It brings together an audience, actors, and then you need so many different types of people to maintain the stage. You even get theatre critics both within Britain and in camps throughout the British Empire, and in camps where Germans are interned by France or Russia as well, for example. The other thing about the theatre is that it allows the image of women to survive, according to some internees. You have cross-dressing internees who have to play the female part. There's one internee I came across called Walter Volanka. Unfortunately, I can't trace his history after he leaves the Douglas internment camp, but he played all the female roles in Douglas. Civilian internees generally didn't work. This was not under the Hague Convention because the Hague Convention was very vague about civilians. The Hague Convention didn't anticipate mass internment during the First World War. The main reason seems to be that the British government didn't get Germans to work because it didn't want British internees in Germany to face the same issue. Having said that, there are examples of civilians working, to put it into quotation marks, is that they established all sorts of committees, kitchen committees and library committees. There's an incredible diagram of one of the sub-camps in Nokelo on the Isle of Man, which illustrates the countless committees which existed. Paul Cohen Portheim would describe this as just pointless bureaucracy because these people are just killing time. That was his phrase. Nevertheless, on the Isle of Man, some civilians do become involved in agricultural work. Some of them are involved in extending the banks of one of the rivers on the Isle of Man. There's camps in London which take orders for military uniforms. Civilians 
generally don't work, but there's lots of examples where they do. Military prisoners are completely different. The reason why military prisoners end up in Britain, especially from 1917, is because of issues with the harvest. There isn't manpower. So from 1917, German military prisoners are extremely important for the harvest, although they can't get enough of them to solve all the issues. If you'd worked in a factory for 20 years before you were captured on the Western Front, that didn't mean you could do agricultural work. So the farmers really liked people who'd worked in farm work before the First World War. It wasn't just agricultural work which the military prisoners carried out. They were also involved in quarrying and a whole variety of occupations. Forestry as well in Scotland, for example. But agriculture was the most important area where they became involved. The German prisoners, especially the military ones, part of their duty is escape. The British newspapers report at some stages that there's dozens of prisoners on the run. However, only three ever make it back to Germany. One of them is called Gunter Plushov, who published a, a memoir about his escape in 1922. He's an interesting case because he was in Tsingtao, which was a German-controlled part of China when the First World War broke out. And then he made it to Gibraltar. He was captured in Gibraltar. Then he was brought to Donington Hall, the officer's camp. His narrative is wonderful. He describes how he planned his escape, how he watched the movement of the guards, how he escaped from Donington Hall, how he got to London, and then how he stowed away and then made it back to Germany. The civilian internees if they escaped, maybe the only place they could go would be back home, and I guess they would be captured there. Having said that, there are examples of people trying to escape from Nokela on the Isle of Man, but none of them even makes it off the Isle of Man. There's one case where they almost make it onto a boat in Douglas, but are captured. Internment was basically a male experience. There's only about eight women who are interned. They're people who are regarded as a military threat. The government decides that all German males are a military threat, but in World War I, they're not unless there's evidence against them. However, being a German woman in World War I Britain was equally grim, and in some ways even more grim than it was for their menfolk. A German woman would include British-born women who had married Germans and therefore took on German nationality. They would receive help from the British government, from charities and from the German government, but it often didn't go very far. And of course, they're facing constant hostility. And the solution was deportation, not internment. So deportation of women starts very early, intensifies after May 1915, when wholesale internment is introduced and continues until the end of the war and beyond. In some cases, we have examples of British-born women who go back to Germany their plight is particularly gruesome because they can't even speak German. They've been victimised in their homeland and then they're victimised in the land in which they've settled. In some cases, the deportation process breaks up families because sometimes the British-born wives are not going to go back. Sometimes the German men go back and then the families just can't stay together and they don't write to each other. I've even come across examples where when the Second World War breaks out, you have one brother fighting for the British Army and another brother fighting for the German Army. At the end of the war in 1918, but also into 1919, there's a deeply resentful Germanophobia that exists in Britain. One of the consequences of this is that the German population should be deported. There was a group called the British Empire Union. Its slogan was the extirpation root and branch and seed of a German control and influence from the British Empire. This had dire consequences for the German community in Britain. If you look at the statistics, when the war broke out, there were 53,324 Germans in Britain, according to the census. At the end of the war, this had gone down to 20,000. In a sense, it's a type of ethnic cleansing. Ethnic cleansing is a phrase which seems to sit very uncomfortably in British history, but I can't see any other way of describing this because if you go back to the slogan of the British Empire Union, okay, it was maybe a fringe group, but then the government implemented this policy. And if you look at the phrase as a whole, it also meant the closing down, confiscation of all German businesses. So you could have had your shop smashed up by rioters in May 1915. At the end of the war, 
your property is confiscated. It even goes towards the reparations payment of the Germans under the Treaty of Versailles. And there is absolutely no way in which you're ever going to get compensation for this. Britain reintroduced internment during the Second World War. It was in a similar way to World War I. It was a panic. It was in June 1940 after Mussolini declared war on Britain. There were anti-Italian riots and the government panicked and it introduced internment. There is a big difference between World War I and World War II because it was Italians and Germans who were interned. But a lot of the Germans are Jewish refugees from the Nazis and they often end up in the same camp as Nazis. But the big difference between World War I and World War II is that the government realises its mistake quite quickly. And so most of the internees during the Second World War are released within a year or 18 months. Some are also deported to Canada and Australia. That was Professor Panikos Panayi on internees and prisoners of war. You have been listening to the British Home Front in the First World War. The podcast series was made possible thanks to the generosity of John Cawthorne and the 1926 Foundation. The conference was supported by the Department for Digital, Culture, Media and Sport and the Scottish Government. It was a Chrome Radio production for the University of St Andrews with music by the pipes and drums of the Royal Scots Dragoon Guards. The producer was Katrina Oliphant with sound design by Chris Sharp. The series editor was Professor Sir Hugh Strawn. Do join us for our next set of podcasts when we look at munitions and clothing production, railways and shipbuilding, shipping and overseas trade.